Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Vital Links mini clinical conversation with Mary Quar and Dr. Carl Hillier. We are so excited that you all were able to take just a couple moments out of your busy day to join us online and to share what these amazing two professionals have brought to us today and just a little conversation. So I'll invite Mary and Carl to say just a quick hello, and then I'm going to go ahead and serve as your kind of facilitator and moderator this morning and just kind of pose a couple questions to you both. So I'll let you say a quick hello. Hi, Mary. Hi. Good morning, Tracy. And good, good morning, Mary. So nice to have you. And good morning, Carl. Good morning. Nice to be here, Tracy. Glad to have you both. So, Mary, I'll just start with you, if that's all right. I'm sure many people are really interested in how you and Carl began a professional relationship together and how you later began teaching together. Would you able be able to share just a little bit about that experience? Okay. Well, um, I um, I uh, be first became aware of Carl through. Um, uh, the um, Steve Cool, who I taught Sheila and I used to teach a course with, with uh, Dr. Cool, and uh, it seemed that uh, in that course I was always wanting to provide more information, and so it was actually Steve who said, uh, "You should really get a hold of of uh, Dr. Carl Hillier because you know he's in San Diego where you are, and um, the two of you should should." Uh, Put together a course where you can spend more time on the vestibular visual interactions and so uh, we did get together and brainstorm came up with the idea of calling the course um, eyesight to insight and uh, covering assessment and treatment of visual and vestibular dysfunction and it's been uh, gosh i've forgotten how many years this course has been going on but uh, it's been a very popular course people have been um, extremely delighted to to really see how how a developmental optometrist and occupational therapist can work together and uh, obviously we have people that attend the course that are not not occupational therapists we have physical therapists and speech therapists but it's been um, a really wonderful collaborative effort and and uh, dr. Hillier and I have shared clients over the years so we've had lots of opportunities to mix and blend the uh, two professions. That sounds like a really amazing experience. And Carl, having seen you work in your office in California, it's, you do such a beautiful job. And I wonder if you might be able to share a little bit how ways that a developmental optometrist and an occupational therapist might be able to collaborate together and work together, especially in situations when you don't have, as I am an occupational therapist, I don't have a developmental optometrist on my staff. How are ways that we can work together in our professions? Well, uh, yeah, thanks for having me be a part of this little get together because um, it, it's absolutely crucial to arrange conditions for, or at least from my perspective, and most of the developmental optometrists that I work with uh, love to have an occupational therapist on board that truly understands the vestibular relationship to visual development. And uh, this groundswell of awareness uh, of OTs knowing this critical relationship and being trained by Mary over the last several years. Uh, has really helped developmental optometrists gain a great relationship with OTs that understand this critical relationship. And so much so that uh, the International College of Optometrists and Vision Development invited Mary Kawar to speak at their international conference uh, several years ago to share with, with all of us what uh, she's been able to teach many OTs around the world about this absolutely critical relationship. So it really bolsters our opportunity to take care of the kids that we work with. Uh, children with visual delays often have underlying vestibular uh, issues with uh, development. And so when Mary goes through this course together with me, the synergistic uh, back and forth that we have really solidifies an OT's understanding of, of what the foundation is for actual visual information processing. Uh, many ODs, all, developmental optometrists, also attend these courses just because they want to hear Mary talk more about that, that crucial underlying relationship. 
Absolutely. You can beautifully see hearing both of you talk, especially in this fashion in the Eyesight to Insight course, how your relationship flows back and forth, not only in your teaching, but over the crossover and how you each have that specialty area. But working together, it makes so much more for not only myself as an OT, but for our clients that we can really work and collaborate together. So it's really fun to see that. And I kind of wonder, and I think maybe both of you could speak to this point, but Carl, as an OT, I think one of the things that I tend to struggle with or have struggled with in the past without knowing more is when and at what point after I do a vision screen and being very precise in my vision screen, where do I take that in terms of is it something that I can support within the context of OT and at what point does it really facilitate a recommendation to go see a developmental optometrist who can really take the treatment that much further. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Well, the deeper an OT's understanding of the language of developmental vision uh, provides an opportunity for a, a professional conversation to occur. And, and so that's the most important thing. So as you do that vision screen that you've been trained to do, uh, you start to see subtle nuances that really reveal this is purely a vestibular issue or this seems to be more of a visually based issue. So that is from a bottom up or a top down visual dysfunction that's interfering with the child's development. And so when you do your vision screening and you do your vestibular evaluation, you can start to tease those two apart and then having a conversation with a developmental optometrist, even if they're from a remote distance, you can oftentimes collaborate and determine what's the best therapeutic pathway for this child. Should we still work on vestibular uh, input to the visual system, or are they now ready to segue into a more visually guided uh, activity based on the types of work that, uh, or the types of activities that, the, that a behavioral optometrist would work in, uh, such as binocular development, accommodative development and facility, um, and these types of things, peripheral vision guiding the movement of the body, so that you can see that, I mean, even the language I'm using now is very much occupational therapy kind of language, but we're approaching it with a visual perspective. Of course, OTs are going to develop a vestibular perspective for this, but there's a huge amount of overlap. And without that communication, it's really hard to know when is it appropriate then to segue into occupational therapy, when is it appropriate to segue into uh, developmental optometry. Now, most of my colleagues, for sure, understand this vestibular foundation, and they're seeking out an OT that understands these principles. Uh, if we can get more OTs that really own the vestibular relationship to vision, we, we love that because we know we need to send our patients first to an OT to establish that foundation, to establish the, the strength and core musculature of the individual, to help them overcome some of the primitive reflex disintegrations that are there. And then once that occurs, then developmental optometry has a much better opportunity to help these children. So most of us believe in a strong occupational therapy foundation. That is an OT that really understands vestibular uh, and sensory motor integration, then segueing into behavioral optometry or developmental optometry. Carl, that was worded so beautifully. It was so wonderful to hear you share that experience. I wonder if you could tell a little bit more or share from your perspective, are there things as an occupational therapist that I can screen in my session that would allow me to feel more comfortable making that referral or knowing that it's more vestibular based? Okay. Well, one of the things that we, we talk about quite a bit, Mary and I, during the course is being able to differentiate the vestibularly driven pursuits, decades, and fixations from the top down, the cortical, the frontal lobe contribution to those skills. So in the beginning, as an OT, we do a lot of work with uh, what, what I'm doing right now is just engaging my vis the visual ocular reflex. And we look at and we isolate, uh, we teach you how to isolate the different semicircular canals, the utricle, the saccula, all those inputs into ocular motor activity. It, without this foundation of ocular motor movement from driven by the vestibular system, we can't have a, a cognitively induced, a top-down, uh, intentionally directed, internally directed ocular motor system for reading. So as an OT, what we teach you to do in this course is to differentiate between is this a vestibularly driven dysfunction or is it a top-down frontal lobe, parietal lobe, 
temporal lobe dysfunction into the vestibular system or into the ocular motor system. So when you do the screening, uh, Mary teaches an incredibly wonderful vestibular screening, and then I go in and I talk about the visual screening, and you see where that overlap occurs, and you, you get very familiar with when is this a vestibular issue and when is this a visual issue. So primarily, and Mary can talk about this much more than I can, but that is doing the vestibular input and watching the ocular output to see if it's intact or, the, or not. If it's not intact, that's where the vestibular treatment comes into play. We call it therapeutic rotation. Once that's really established and, and the OT feels comfortable knowing that that's established from a vestibular perspective, then we can segue into uh, the visual part. And so that's where the visual screen comes into play. After you've done the vestibular, you do the visual screen, and then you see that, okay, there's a binocular dysfunction that's contributing to this. There might be an accommodative dysfunction that's contributing to this. And you can, we break it down into fixations, saccades, and pursuits. Binocular issues such as convergence insufficiency, convergence excess, all the various types of strabismus and amblyopias are covered in depth so that when an OT leaves that course, they're fluent and confident with the language of vision, and there's no apprehension or insecurity in regards to communicating these things with other professionals. And you really own those concepts after you learn to do that screening and you go through that two-day course. Thank you so much, Carl. That was a really thorough answer and highlights how there's so much more to learn, but you do it so beautifully. So thank you so much, Carl. I'm going to ask Mary one more question, um, but I really appreciate you joining us online this morning, Carl, and taking time to, to be here with us. Mary, one last question for you this morning. I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit from an OT perspective in terms of what functional difficulties I might see or my clients might demonstrate, which may indicate or lead me to wonder about difficulties with the vestibular and visual system that are thus impacting their function. Certainly, this can uh, can manifest in various ways. There, there are some children that are... are um, highly over dependent on on vision so they're they're kind of visually always uh, very very alert afraid to go into the dark uh, and uh, this is a good indication when when there are these kinds of anxieties that there is definitely a lack of vestibular information available to the system and so the child has had to learn how to compensate by using overusing vision uh, to make up for that uh, vestibular deficit and so that, that's certainly one manifestation. And then there are other children that, that seem to be oblivious to, to their environment. Uh, they're just, they're just hyper-focused on details, so much so that they, they really um, shut down their awareness of the environment that they're in. And so that's, that's another uh, kind of uh, difficulty that we see. And we see children that uh, when we ask them to, to use their vision, they may start rubbing their eyes and, and you might see them tearing so that you can see obvious indications that, um, that this, this visual system is um, not working in a way that's, that's easy and um, functional and effective. So there, there just are so many, so many ways uh, because you know, the OT environment is a very, very busy environment, and and we 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 kind of um, expect that a child is going to be eager to to engage with with things. But you know, some children come in and they they just are so distractible they can't stay with any one thing. Whereas other children are 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 just overwhelmed and and uh, shut down. And you know, some children um, will. It's it's like there are the the full extremes between a child that. Um, um, you know, loves to move versus one who's who's really very, very overwhelmed and and um, uh, reticent about getting on movement equipment. And all of these are are certainly um, an indication that that this, that visual system, not only you know other sensory systems, but the visual system, is not able to to effectively process uh, the the environment that they're in and uh, causing them a lot of struggles. And I think that um, I just kind of uh, would like to move into talking a little bit about how important it is for, for occupational therapists to, to be able to do a good vision screening to see 
what component of the visual system is not is not working for them. And um, you know, it, it's only been I think in the last 20 years that OTs have have begun to to uh, learn how to do a vision screening and and appreciate what what is uh, happening. Um, or not, what is not working with the child. I think we, as, as therapists, we, we really started working in, more in the cognitive aspects of you know, visual information processing without ever knowing how to take a look at the, how well those two eyes are working together, how well the muscles of the eyes can, can move in, uh, in the orbit and be able to look at things near and far and, and, and uh, close in versus... Um, uh, taking in the surround. And so many times without this ability to do a vision screening, we may not be able to do the the best uh, kind of um, analysis of, of the treatment strategies uh, that are needed. And so um, once we can do a good vision screening, then I think we're in a good position to to build this um, ongoing relationship with, with a developmental optometrist. And, and I, I just find that, that developmental optometrists are so, so easy and wonderful to work with because they really think very functionally like, like we do as OTs. So we, we have a, a common understanding and, and that relationship is often quite different than working with an ophthalmologist uh, who doesn't have uh, the, quite the same um, functional approach to, to the vision system and all of the many ramifications of vision. Um, and uh, Dr. Hillier mentioned the the overlap between um, between optometry and occupational therapy, and I think it's a very wholesome um, overlap because even if we might be doing the same activity, our orientation to that particular activity is going to be different, and so uh, the client is going to benefit from these different orientations that focus around um, purposeful activities. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Mary. That was really insightful and really enjoyable to listen to both you and Carl speak this morning. I want to honor the time that we had invited our participants to join us for. So I just want to make a quick little announcement. I know a couple of you had been asking, Carl had referenced, and Mary as well, a course where we can learn more about the visual system and the integration with the vestibular system and how to do some of those vision screens that Carl was talking about. So the specific course that they they are referencing is the Eyesight to Insight course, and Mary and Carl have two courses coming up through Vital Links. The first one is a live course in Atlanta, Georgia, coming up this October 9th and 10th. It should be really wonderful to be able to join Mary and Carl live and get lots of hands-on experience with this course material. They also have an online course coming up December 4th and 5th, which is another great way to hear this material in a similar fashion as we've just done in our clinical conversation right now. For those of you who are interested in joining us in the Atlanta course coming up, we have a special offer for the Eyesight to Insight and the additional Quick Shift course, which is offered on that Sunday, October 11th. So for those of you who decide to register for the Eyesight to Insight course, you then, I will put a coupon code in the chat box, you will then be eligible to take the Quick Shift course for $99 as an additional uh, add-on to that. So it's a great option. It's a great way to get a lot of material and interact with Mary and Carl, and Sheila will be there teaching the quick shifts on Sunday. So a lot of really fabulous material in a short amount of time. So I will put that code into the chat box. It is capital E, number two, capital I, capital Q, and capital S. So that is in the chat box, and hopefully we look forward to having all of you join us for a future course. And I want to say a big thank you to Mary and Carl for taking time out of their day to share a little bit more about their experiences and their collaborations together. So thank you to both of them, and I hope everyone has a wonderful day, and we will see you all online or in person soon. Thank you.